It's quite refreshing for me to be able to uh, talk in an academic fashion because I don't have to justify everything or explain everything. I found that as Buddhism has gone to the West and Western culture has taken up this uh, teaching, what they've tried to do is separate what is cultural baggage from what is the essence of the religion. And so what you end up with is a fairly dry kind of uh, mindfulness which is used as a, almost as a therapeutic tool. It's used as a, a form of psychology or psychotherapy. And while I value that, I'm happy for people to do what they want. I don't want people to do what I want. You know, so if that's what people want to do, I have no problem with that. But for my own perspective, it's quite, you know, the stories that we have that are part of Buddhism uh, really capture the essence of the religion. And to always ask ourselves, is the story actually true, is something that I would try to avoid. So, since you're coming here uh, and I presented this as an academic approach, that means I can just give you the stories and you can do with it what you like. I don't have to get you to do meditation or chanting or anything like that. We can just you know, enjoy the uh, stories and the way that people will understand Buddhism. Uh, last week I mentioned about the, uh, the story of Gotama and the Earth Goddess. And when he became enlightened, uh, he sat underneath a Bodhi tree and the armies attacked him. Armies of Mara, the god of delusion, attacked him and tried to dissuade the Buddha from enlightenment. And he called upon the earth goddess as a witness to all the good deeds that he'd done in the past. And every time he'd done a good deed, in countless lifetimes, he'd poured water on the earth as a symbol of the transference of merits. And so then he calls upon the earth goddess as a witness to all the good deeds that he's done so that enlightenment is his by right. And if we get into the mythology uh, or the legend side of Buddhism, some people get enlightened through wisdom. Some people get enlightened through faith. Some people get enlightened through surrender. I would argue, in fact, that surrender is the key word in all of these different paths. So in India, it's well understood that there are different paths to the ultimate attainment. There is bhakti yoga, uh, surrender through faith. There is uh, Hatha Yoga or Hatha Yoga, which is a kind of balance, if I can sum it up into one word. There is uh, Raja Yoga, the enlightenment through the force of will. Jnana Yoga, the enlightenment through separating what's real from what's unreal. So it's well understood that there are these different paths. The path of an actual Buddha I find is interesting because a Buddha becomes enlightened by right. Everyone else has to do some kind of practice, some kind of wisdom or some kind of surrender or devotion. But a Buddha gets enlightened by right because he's done so many lifetimes of practice that there's nothing left, no good deed left that he has to do. So I find that very interesting. And he calls upon the earth goddess as a witness to all the good things that he's done. Now, do you understand this story as a metaphor? Is this sitting and doing enlightenment and then you know, all these delusional thoughts come up in your brain and all these memories and wants and desires and come? Uh, that's one way to understand it. And that's a very rationalistic sense. If you take that stance, you are take, trying to rationalize the story um, you might understand it that there actually are demons and forces outside of yourself 
Are they supernatural devas and demons? Are they uh, just the forces of the world and greed and hatred and delusion in the world? And TV shows and Breaking Bad and Downton Abbey are these things. Because when you meditate, these images come back up, right? So these are like these delusional images that you welcomed in from the outside, disturbing you. Well, <clears throat> I would suggest that we don't want to spend too much effort trying to make sense of everything. Because a lot of it doesn't make sense, right? And I would suggest that that's all right. We don't have to rationalize the story or explain the story. The story is the story. That's how it is, that's how it works, that's how it's being passed on to us. And when I talk to my uh, Asian students, the monks, mostly monks from Cambodia, Laos, Burma, in the university, and I ask them these kind of questions, they kind of just accept the story. So, for example, the Buddha poured water on the earth every time he did a good deed. Have you seen this done in Thai temples? When the, you make an offering, and then usually you take the precepts, you do a little chanting, you make an offering, and then uh, the monk gives the blessing, and then after the bless, while he's giving the blessing, you pour water from one container into another container. And that is to symbol the transference of merits. So what do you think? Is this pouring of the water, you pour it from one container to another, and then after the ceremonies are finished, you pour that water onto a tree or something living outside. Is this an animistic superstition or is this pure Buddhism? And what happens, I find many people come to uh, Buddhism and really want to make it into something very rational. And then they look at things like pouring the water and they say, well, that's animism, that's superstition. Pouring water doesn't get you enlightened. You know, the way that you train your mind or your meditation might get you enlightened, but pouring water, that's superstition. And a lot of Westerners come to Thailand and they learn about the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path, some of these key teachings in Buddhism. And then look around at the way Buddhism is practiced in the local society and say, that's not real Buddhism, that's superstition or that's animistic things. So that's the topic of today's talk. Where does superstition and amonistic, animistic rites and rituals, where do these fit into the, um, into the framework of Buddhism? I wanted to start with an example, and actually it's not Buddhist, but is an interesting story. From a few years ago, Nepal's state-run airline <clears throat> sacrificed two goats to appease a Hindu god following technical problems with one of their aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> They said the animals were slaughtered in front of the Boeing 757 at Kathmandu airport. The offering was made to Akash Bhairab, the Hindu god of sky protection, whose symbol is seen on the aeroplanes. <laughs> the airline said after the ceremony, the plane successfully completed a flight to Hong Kong. <laughs> obviously worked, right? <laughs> The snag in the plane has now been fixed and the aircraft has resumed its flights, said a senior official. Nepal Airlines has two Boeing aircraft in its fleet and persistent faults with one of the planes led to a postponement of a number of flights. So, what do you think? Superstition? Religion? Animism? What do you think? <laughs> the idea of sacrificing something for something else is something that goes way back into the 
heart of humanity. And there are probably very good reasons for it. It turns out that we can study this in the modern day. And it seems that when you make a deliberate sacrifice for something, you increase your relationship to that thing. You improve your relationship to it. And you get into the essence of that thing. You tap into the entire, it's called quan, or the essence. Uh, essence, we could also use the word symbol. Right? Now, a good example of making a public demonstration of commitment to something. A good example would be getting married. You get all your friends and your relatives, and you hire a big hall, and you dress up in particular costumes, and you do this funny walk as you come down the aisle. Is this superstition? Is this an animistic thing? Most people, you know, if you've got married, you've been through this ceremony. If you make a big show of commitment to something, you increase your own commitment to that thing. And this is why hazing rituals still work in universities. If you're going to be in a fraternity or a sorority, sor 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 <laughs> in England we have clubs, we don't have the... <laughs> <laughs> We have the football club and the things, we don't have this. So, why are these hazing rituals so persistent in universities? It's a big problem in Thailand, right? If you read in the newspapers, you see every year they have this problem, people die or get humiliated and all kinds of problems arise. If you make a sacrifice to something, you increase your commitment to it. So if you've gone through a difficult hazing ritual to become member of that club, you're more likely to support and maintain your support for that club. So this is where this idea of sacrifice comes from. The monk's robes are exactly that. Going out in bright orange with a shaved head, you know, it's like a beacon, right? To say, hey, I've committed to this path. I'm not like you. I'm different to you. I have a different vinaya or code of conduct to regular people and it's something that when you, you go out into society you're making that statement. So you're increasing your commitment to that code of conduct, to those rules. And that's what the vinaya is. So today I wanted to talk about two things. One is superstition and animism uh, and the other is uh, the vinaya or the rules and regulations around month. So, why are these symbols so important? What we do to understand something, we try to boil it down into a essence or a symbol. Now that essence you might understand as a tree spirit or a river spirit. Uh, I was reading this one story recently, I forget the name, and the guy goes through the river and he as he's crossing the river, there's a big storm and the boat is smashed. He ends up back on the bank from which he had left. And while he's sitting on the bank, a crocodile arrives. And the crocodile says to him, you didn't pay respect to the god of the river. And that's why your ship was destroyed. Now, if you are willing to pay respect to the god of the river, you can jump on my back and I will take you across the river. So what happens when a human being gets on the back of a crocodile? You might know this story, the scorpion on the back of the frog, right? You know that story? Well, in this version of the story, the man says, fine. And he makes a sacrifice to the god of the river. He jumps on the crocodile's back. And the crocodile takes him across to the other shore. And when he gets to the other shore, he gets off the crocodile and says, thanks. And they never had any more problem. <laughs> I really like this story, this pathos at the end of the story. You're waiting for the crocodile to eat the man, right? Because that's the nature of a crocodile. But the story is saying that if you pay respects to the essence of things, 
then your relationship to things will go more smoothly. Now, why do we like to boil down to the essence? I mean, the river is a complicated thing. It has tides, it has seasons, it has rip currents, deposits sand on one side, it cuts mountains on the other side, it has oxbow lakes. I mean, a river is a, is a complicated thing. So we like to boil the idea of a river down to a simple symbol so that we can relate to that river. In this case, the simple symbol is we are respectful of the river. So why do we boil things down to symbols like this? The idea is that the world is too complicated for us to understand. Some years ago, I read this book, 25 years ago, by Carl Sagan, who was once one of my heroes, my childhood hero of mine, a scientist. I reread him recently and I was immensely disappointed. But, um, he certainly was a formative part of my early life. And in this book, Broker's Brain, he talked about a grain of salt. How many atoms are there in a grain of salt? And the spatial information of how those atoms are arranged with each other. Then he looked at how many neurons there are in a brain, and then how many connections between the neurons there are in a brain. And there are more connections be between the neurons in the brain than there are stars in the galaxy. And there's an awful lot of stars in the galaxy, more than we can actually possibly imagine. So then he's saying, well, can a human brain with all of these connections has a limit on the complexity that it can hold. Can it hold a grain of salt? Can it fully know a grain of salt? Can it grok a name of salt? <laughs> There's only a couple of people here who got that joke, but you got that joke, okay. I've been dying to use that word, grok. I, I've just finished the book, so. <laughs> grok means to fully understand something. It's a long story. And his conclusion was that a human brain cannot know a grain of salt. It's too complicated. There's too much information there. So the only way we can approach a grain of salt is to boil it down to a few essences. And if we understand the essence or the pattern, we have a good enough working representation of salt, a grain of salt, what it's used for, etc. And that's a grain of salt. What about a human being? How do we understand this? Right. I've been reading this great book called I Am a Strange Loop, and he's talking about all the things that we can juggle. He says you can drive a car and be interacting with the other cars. You can be thinking about where you're going. You can be thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. You can be talking on the phone and texting on the phone at the same time. <laughs> And while you're talking on the phone, you might be thinking about something, not just the person you're talking to, but the subject that you're talking about. You're juggling seven or eight realities all at the same time. And yet we do this effortlessly. So the idea of the symbols is we, we can boil something down to a symbol so that we can relate to it more easily. And this is where kind of superstition and animism starts to come into play. It's a way that you can relate to things. Okay? And the stories are important. The stories are what? You know, the way that we understand things. Interestingly, only human beings can layer these symbols and stories on top of each other. With a dog, if you remember Pavlov's experiments, you give the dog food and you ring the bell. No, you ring the bell, then you give the dog food. So the dog associates the bell with the food. So after a while it hears the bell and it salivates. So then they try to layer more symbols onto that, make a clicking sound and then ring the bell. Does the dog salivate or not? And then you can sound a buzzer, make a clicking noise, ring the bell, <laughs> and so on and so forth. But once you get two or three layers away from that unconditioned stimulus of food, 
The dog can't follow it. Even the best animals can't follow layered symbols. But human being, we layer symbols upon symbols upon symbols upon symbols. In the, we have no limit to our way that we can do this. So, for example, you get home at night, you flick on the light switch, you don't think anything of it, right? But to do that, you have to have some kind of idea of what electricity is, right? Some kind of way that you interact with and relate to electricity. Keep it away from water, for example. I, I would bet there's not a person in this room who understands what electricity is. I've tried my hardest to understand and I can't, I can't get it. And I really have tried hard and I can't understand electricity. You know, the electrons move at three meters per minute down the wire. It's very strange, right? How can they produce electricity in Canterbury from a coal-powered station and it moves at three meters a minute and yet somehow the electricity is coming out your sockets almost instantly. It's very... I, I never could understand it. But you have an understanding of electricity. You know it's generated in a big power station they're burning coal in Kanchanaburi, or they're burning gas in Burma, or they're burning thorium for nuclear power. I'm a big supporter of nuclear power, by the way. <laughs> you have an understanding of what glass is, right? Glass that makes up the light bulb. You have a basic understanding of a filament inside a light bulb that has current running through it and, and light. You have a basic understanding that filament will eventually react with the other molecules in the, in the argon or the, the gas that they put in the light bulb. Have I already lost some of you on this? <laughs> <laughs> the point is, you have a lot of these stories, a lot of things that you relate to, and symbols that you can relate to, but human beings, we can layer these symbols upon symbols upon symbols. So you can just go home and flick on a light switch, and not even be aware of these layers and layers of understanding that you have about the world around you. So, the stories. I thought every week I'm going to give you an interesting Buddhist story, so here's one of the stories. After the Buddha had probably gone to study the Vedas, I'm a little alone in that thesis, but I would say he'd gone to study the Vedas, he came back home, he had a child, and he named his child Rahula, which means fetter, or a bull and chain. What a name to give to your child, right? Because his child is born and he says, oh no, you know, that's tied me to my wife and my house and my family. And that is a fetter, that's something that's tying me up. And so he left the home and the family and he went off. A few years ago we had a discussion, was the Buddha right to leave his family and child? Within the Buddhist story, yes. You ask any Asians this question and they're like, well yeah, of course, this is out of compassion for all world beings that he left. So, he crosses the river on the boundary of the, um, you know, the kingdom or the fiefdom of which his family was the head. And he decides to become a samana, which is a monk, into the robes and the shaved head. And he shaves off his hair and he throws his hair into the air. And he says, if I'm going to be successful in my quest, may this hair not land back on the ground. And he throws his hair up. And the story goes that Indra came down and caught the hair so that it didn't land back on the ground. What do you think? Superstition? Is this Buddhism? The teaching of enlightenment? When I ordained as a monk, I threw my hair up and it <laughs> straight down. <laughs> huh. So later on, he, he does six years of ascetic practices, which again, ascetic practices is a sacrifice, right? It's a way of making a sacrifice, just like they sacrifice the goats in front of the plane. Ascetic practices is a sacrifice to the path 
It strengthens your resolve on the path, strengthens your resolve to do the meditation. Later on, of course, the Buddha said, okay, ascetic practices are not going to make you enlightened by themselves. There is another layer that you have to do on top of that. However, he did remain committed to ascetic practices his whole life. Make that point. So, after the years of ascetic practices, he realizes, you know, that's, I'm still not enlightened. So he decided that he was going to start eating again because he'd starved himself so that if he put his hand on his stomach, he could feel his backbone. A little excessive. Some of us do fasting, you know, like 24-hour fasting and not quite to the same level, you know. And then the story goes that Sujata, a Brahmin, came to make an offering to the local god, local spirits. And it was an offering of purified milk rice. But when she saw the Buddha, she was so struck by his form and his saintliness that she decided to give it to him instead. And he, so he ate this rice, this offering, milk rice. And when he'd finished, he went to the river and he bathed and he washed his bowl. Right? And after he washed his bowl, he floated it in the stream. And he said, if I am to attain to enlightenment this very day, may my bowl float upstream. And the story goes that the bowl floated upstream against the current. So, what are you, how are you going to relate to a story like this? Right? Did this actually happen? Was there a weird eddy in the current of the stream that actually managed to take it upstream? Coincidentally, that strange coincidence of an eddy in the current and then the Buddha says, oh, that means I get enlightened today. It gives him that placebo effect and he sits and he meditates and he becomes enlightened. Is that what happened? Do these supernatural weird things really happen? I, I've seen weirder stuff than that. Don't ask me about it. But, you know, I've seen weird things. Can we really rationalize? Uh, do we want to explain away these things? Or do you just take the story for the way that it is? It's the story of a person who has gone through all kinds of practices and is about to enter his final battle for enlightenment with an immense resolve. So it's a story that demonstrates that resolve, right? To the practice, to the enlightenment. So we can relate to the Buddha's resolve by means of the symbols in the story. You're also relating to the way that monks interact with people. You know, we have our alms bowl and people put offering into the alms bowl. And the contract is that because we receive offerings in our bowl from lay people, we are thereby committed to being serious and um, sincere on doing the practice and doing the path. So all these kind of ideas also tied up in this story, right? What it means to be a monk, what it means to be a layperson, what it means to make offerings to ascetics and to support people in their meditation practice. So within this story, you have a whole layers of these symbols, right? Essences that we boil down to certain symbols and put together in a story. And it's through that story that you then relate to the world. Now, many people would say, you know, floating bowls upstream, that's, that's just superstition. Well, is it superstition or is it a useful story? So I would encourage you today, my thesis is, to suspend judgment when we come to study all things, but especially Buddhism. Suspend judgment and enter into the story. The story has a value. It helps us in our way that we relate to the world. It helps manipulate these symbols that we have. At what point does a story become superstition? 
symbols become superstition. Do you know the one about the five monkeys and the ladder and the bananas? And there's the bananas at the top of the ladder and when a monkey goes up the ladder, the experimenters douse the monkey with water, cold water, and the monkey doesn't like it. Most monkeys don't like water unless they're trained. So, after a while, the monkeys don't want to go up the ladder anymore, right? But every so often they get overpowered by the, by the sight of the bananas and they'll give it a try and they get soaked. Then the experimenters changed it. And every time a monkey went up the ladder, instead of soaking that monkey, they would soak the other four monkeys. <laughs> right? So now what happens is the monkeys know that if one of them goes up for the bananas, the other guys get drenched. So as soon as one of them is overpowered by desire and climbs the ladder, what happens is the other four will give him a beating. And so very quickly the monkeys learn, if you go on that ladder you get a beating. Then what they did was very interesting, one by one they changed each of the five monkeys. And each new monkey that went in learned this ritual about beating somebody who went on the ladder. And if they went on the ladder, they got a beating. And if another monkey went on the ladder, they got a beating. Right. Now you'll notice here that there's no longer any monkeys getting drenched with water. We've removed the original problem altogether. They replaced each of the five monkeys until there wasn't a single monkey in the room that had ever been drenched. But they still gave a beating to any monkey that climbed on the ladder. Right? So this is demonstrating when a story has a value and a purpose and the original value and purpose has gone or been forgotten and what you're left with is a superstitious ritual or rite that no longer has any meaning. So when we're talking about animism and the stories and superstition and we're trying to separate what's real from unreal, I would suggest a different way to approach it. Separate what is still useful from what is no longer useful. I have the same thing that I see outside my window in the, I used, my room used to overlook the car park in the temple. And in the car park, the dogs, when the dogs do a poo, you know what they do? They kick their back leg, right? In the forest, this makes sense. You're covering the package, the parcel, with dirt, cleans it up a little bit. Interestingly, dogs will use their back leg, but cats will use their front leg. Is this a cat and dog superstition? <laughs> no, no, you, you can imagine the mummy dog and the da you know, child dog. No, no, you must kick with your back leg. Why? You just do it, that's why. That <laughs> that's the way we do things. But now the dogs are on a concrete car park. There's no dirt there to kick, but they still do it, right? This is a dog superstition. So it's something that they're still doing, but the purpose is no longer relevant. So, the idea of animism and animistic practices, you see all of these things happening in the Buddhist suttas. The Buddha was very happy for people to make offerings to local shrines and coming from a Christian background this is a little strange because in Christianity they teach you will have no other god but me, I am a jealous god, right? And you shall not bow down to graven idols. But in Buddhism there is no teaching of exclusivity. There is no reason for you only to follow Buddhism and Four Noble Truths. If you want to make an offering to a local shrine or something, go ahead and do it. It's like cricket. I would spend a year in a deep, damp dungeon with no windows, not even any Wi-Fi, <laughs> before I would watch one hour of cricket. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's, <laughs> that's how diabolical I think cricket is. It, it, it is utterly, utterly dreadful. I can't think of it. <laughs> Some people are nodding in agreement to me. And I'm a man of peace. And I, and I don't like armies. And I don't like military governments for that matter. All around the world, you know, American army, one million people in the army, right? One million soldiers, there's three or four million actually in the armed services. And then, I mean, there's a lot of people in this thing. Why? Is there any country in this world less likely to be invaded than America? Right? You think those evil Canadians are going to come down and invade <laughs> the biggest army? So I'm against army, I, I'm against weapons, I'm against war, I'm against violence, but I love the boxing. <laughs> <laughs> I hate cricket, I love boxing. But I don't want to stop people from watching cricket. Just because I don't like cricket and I don't practice cricket. I don't want to stop other people. You want to watch cricket, that's fine. So long as I have a remote control and I can turn it off. Sometimes I eat in the Indian restaurant in, by Sapanpur and they, always, they have the cricket on the whole time. I suggested to them several times that maybe we try the other channel, but it didn't go down very well. So the same with the religion. There's absolutely, there's no reason because you have a set of beliefs or a set of stories, there's no reason to look at other beliefs and other stories and say, don't do that. So when we come to a lot of Westerners, when they come to see Thai Buddhism, they look at it and they say, Thai Buddhists are full of superstitions. Well, why not? That's the way that you relate to the world. The Buddha never said that you should not have these kind of ways of thinking. You know, one time the monks were meditating in the forest and they couldn't get their minds concentrated. So they went to the Buddha and they said, our meditation is rubbish, can you give us some help? So what do you think this great wise man, what kind of advice did he give them to aid their meditation? Four Noble Truths, did he talk about hindrances and greed or delusion in the mind? Not a bit of it. He said, the reason your meditation is no good, the tree spirits in the area are angry at you. And he said, so, I will give you a recitation, a chant. Go and do this chant to the tree spirits to appease them and then your meditation will be okay. So if you went to a temple and you asked for some advice about your meditation and they said this to you, what would you say? He's just superstitious, animistic, nonsense, right? Not really. You would make the offerings to the tree spirits. Some of us would. I like it. Now, the chant, the recitation that was given was the metta chant. Metta meaning um, loving kindness. So this was the verses on loving kindness. Was this a very clever teacher who was telling them to say, okay, give loving kindness to the creatures and the area that you're in to change the way you relate to that area and that will make your meditation go better? I think that's over-rationalizing it. Are there really devas sitting in the trees around you? And do they really get in good and bad moods depending on what you do? Yeah. What do you think? Are there really devas and angels and ghosts? When I first entered the temple, uh, you become an anagarika, which means shaved head and you dress in white. And you go and live in the temple and you have about half of the monk's rules so you're kind of half in, half out, and you can test to see if you really want to become a monk, and the monks can test you to see if you're suitable. So as I was going in to do this, I went around the shops in London, and I wanted to buy white clothes. And I went to all these shops and said, I want to buy white clothes, all white, nothing but white, no emblems, no logos, just white clothes, tops, bottoms, pants, anything you've got, I'll have it. And of course, in the 
uh, in London in these kind of Arabic areas, they fall over themselves and they're bringing me blue stuff with a little white dot on it and, you know, anything to try and sell me stuff. And so I went to three or four or five of these shops and then I went into the one shop and I said, I want all white clothes, nothing but white, pure white, t-shirts, bottoms, pants, anything you've got, bring it to me. And instead of going off to get these clothes, he looked straight at me and he went, why? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was really taken aback. I wasn't expecting that. And he doesn't have all the symbols for what it means to be a Buddhist, to be on the path, for enlightenment and monasteries. So I would have to explain the entire thing to him, right? Which I wasn't prepared to do. So I said to him, oh well, the place that I'm going, you have to dress in all white. And I swear to God, he said to me, you're going to be an angel. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> so do you believe in angels? Do you believe that the devas are really there? Or do you just take this metta chant, this loving-kindness chant, and do the recitation, do this loving-kindness meditation? Okay, so there are a lot of these um, kind of things. I've got a whole bunch of more things, but I, I think I'll skip many of them. Uh, one of the big, then, forms the important parts of Buddhism is the form. And before I came to Thailand, I went to India and I went to see a teacher called Papaji or Punjaji. And at that time, many of the people were leaving the monasteries to go and see this man, Papaji. And he was reputedly enlightened. I believe he was enlightened. You know, how do you tell? Is there a test that you can give? You, know, you see these things on Facebook, you know, do this quiz and we'll tell you <laughs> what nationality you are and thing. Can you do this and tell if somebody's enlightened or not? I did one of these the other day. It's totally true. And it asked you a couple of questions and it was identifying six body types. And the main question was where fat accumulates on your body whether it's the thighs or the whole body or the upper torso. And for me, it's here. That's my visceral white fat here. This is one reason why we wear robes, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so it's right here. And so I clicked on the couple of questions that it asked me. And it tells you your personality type, tells you your problem in life and how to solve it. Right? I can't remember my personality type, but my problem in life, too much stress and anxiety. <laughs> the way to solve this fat problem, not joking, it said, any kind of meditation. <laughs> <laughs> How can you tell if someone's enlightened? You can't, but you know, I believe that this particular man was enlightened. So uh, on my way to Thailand, I went to see him and he was beautiful and I had a great time. In those days, you had to go to India and you had to ask around and ask people, do you know someone called Papaji or Punjaji and they send you to the wrong place? And it took me like three weeks of getting bounced around before I finally managed to find this man in Lucknow. But what I found was a lot of people believed in him and had some interesting ideas and thoughts and feelings, but there was no form. He would talk and answer questions, but there wasn't any way that you could join the club, the sorority, soror, the club, <laughs> right? There wasn't a form to the teachings, there wasn't a vehicle or a way that you could really get into what he was teaching and why he was teaching it. You could just hear him answer different questions about things, and it's beautiful to do that. But I really felt like when I got to Thailand and I went and I found my teacher in Thailand, it's, I felt so happy that there was a monkhood, there was a vinaya. Vinaya means the rules and regulations for monks, which means a form and a vehicle. The rules and regulations. There's a clear teaching that gets agreed upon and recited and 
understood by each new generation, each new wave of monks that comes in. And I was so happy to get into the Buddhist monastery. Even though my teacher is quite extraordinary. You know, we can't tell stories about teachers until they've passed away. So when he's passed away, then I'll tell you all the stories about him. Because the form is the vehicle for the teaching, the vehicle for transformation. And this form is what we call the Vinaya, the monk's rules and regulations. Now, I don't know why people are very interested in monk's rules and regulations. And they're always speculating on it. Should a monk have a vintage Mercedes or not? <laughs> you know this story, right? It's going through the newspapers. Yeah, some of you are like, what? Uh, it's my abbot, actually. The Bangkok Post says that he has a luxury car collection in his garage. I would invite you, if you have any question, be a better journalist than the Bangkok Post journalists and just come to the temple and have a look. It's right there, it's free of charge. It's, you know, anyone can walk in or out during the daytime. But people speculate, they say monks shouldn't have possessions, it's greed. Like, yeah, but you know, what about health insurance? Something I'm looking at right now. If I don't have health insurance, it's pretty dumb. A few years ago, we used to get free health treatment in the monk's hospital, but now they've changed that, and we don't. So I'm having to get health insurance now. And you could pay for it. They don't say, oh, you're a monk, we'll give it to you for free. Should we have cell phones? And as often people take pictures of monks talking on cell phones, look at these bad monks. But then a lot of you call me up for things. What time are you getting here? I'm like, I shouldn't have a cell phone. I'm not going to... Yeah, what? <laughs> then you've got the problem, where do I get the cell phone? You don't like to see monks in shops buying things. Where do I get the cell phone from? Where do I fix it? Where do I get the SD card for it? So, you know, all of these questions come up. And then things like, should monks drink coffee? It's, a, it's addictive. Monks should not drink coffee. Why do you care so much about what monks do? I don't get it. This is our business. But I don't understand why it endlessly fascinates people what monks should and shouldn't do. I should say the monks are pretty bad at this too. In one temple in Bangkok, you know that we eat only in the morning, right? But in the evening there are certain things that are allowed. Honey, molasses, certain things made from beans and curds. We don't even know what the things are, a lot of them, or what they mean. Some people say it's yogurt, some people say it's cheese, some people say it's milk. I mean, each temple has its own form. So my temple, we will drink milk in the evening. But if I go to a temple where they don't drink milk in the evening, well, then I don't drink it. I follow their system. But some temple, there's one particular temple in Thailand, and each building has different rules. <laughs> and I think what it is, is they compete with each other to be the most strict. Because if we have a stricter rule, that makes us better than those terrible people in the building next door to us, right? So I had a cup of coffee, and I had milk in my coffee. And this monk said to me, you've got milk in your coffee. Milk is food. So that monks can only eat once a day, that is your food, that's your meal for the day. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, my coffee cup is my arms bowl and that little bit of milk is my meal for the day. Yes, he said, if you drink that coffee, you can't eat anything else. I said, if I put sugar in it, is that my dessert? <laughs> <laughs> and then another building, they will allow milk in the morning, but not the afternoon. Another building, they will allow coffee mate in the afternoon, but they don't allow milk in the morning. Another one they have, you can have molasses and honey, but you can't have sugar. You've got to go around like six buildings just to get your coffee in the morning, get your ingredients from each place. It's re so the monks are just as bad. I mean, we, we don't agree on these rules and regulations. There are a lot of weird rules. 
Uh, and one of the interesting things is in the suttas, the teachings that the Buddha gave, you'd have somebody come to the Buddha and say, I believe that consciousness goes from lifetime to lifetime. And the Buddha would say, you were wrong. And then the Buddha would give a teaching. And at the end of the teaching, the man would go, oh, it is so fantastic. May I be a disciple of yours for every lifetime that I spend in the future. You have turned upright what was upside down. You have clarified everything and I want to be your disciple. And that's how it goes in the suttas, usually. A little bit of rewriting may have gone in there. Did the Buddha win every single argument like this? But in the monk's rules, we have the opposite story. And this is something that lay people don't see very often because it's not really your business. But um, the Buddha refused to lay down the rules and regulations for monks. But what he did do is when somebody transgressed a code of conduct or a behavior, he would make a rule about it. So there were these six monks and the six monks went into the village three times a day to get their alms food. Morning, breakfast, lunch and evening meal. And the Buddha comes along and he sees them doing this. And the locals had complained to him that they're giving too much food to these greedy monks. So he goes to these monks and he says, Monks, I go for my alms food once a day and I'm happy and I'm contented. That's a pretty big hint, right? So he leaves. And the six monks say to themselves, we go for our alms food three times a day and we're happy and we're contented, just like the Buddha. <laughs> and so eventually the Buddha comes back and he says, right, I gave you the hint, you didn't take it, therefore I make the rule, you only eat once a day. But then what happens if you're invited out? Oh, and he said, dawn is the time. You go for your arms around it. At dawn, that's your time of the day. But then some people invited the monks out, which was after dawn. And he said, all right, a bit after dawn, you can still go for your meal. And then the, the rule evolved. And eventually it settled that monks can eat from dawn to midday, which is one quarter of the day we can receive alms food. Up to two times, doesn't mean one time only. So we start to see a lot of the bad behavior of the monks of the time, which I find interesting. Because many people believe or feel that humanity is getting worse. Do you think that? And often we ask the question, you know, the Buddha taught people and they all became enlightened. We have the same teachings, but we're not getting enlightened. Why is that? And the received teaching in Buddhism is, well, people were so much purer back then. But when you read the Vinaya, you see all these terrible things that the monks used to get up to. Another monk, he went home for a visit and his family said to him, you know, you're our only son and what you haven't done for us is give us some heirs. So we need some heirs for the family to continue. And he said, all right, bring me a couple of women. And he slept with them to leave them pregnant. And then he went back to the forest. And then the monk, the Buddha laid down this rule. Okay, anyone who has sex with another human being is defeated. You are no longer a monk from that point on. Even that rule had to get changed a few times afterwards. I'm getting a bit late on time, so I, I won't tell you the full story. So, a lot of these rules, we don't know even what they mean. There is my favorite rule. A monk is not permitted to sit on a collapsible chair on the second story of a building that has an incomplete floor. <laughs> what does that even mean? And this is one of the rules that we recite in Pali every two weeks. I mean, what? <laughs> so, I started off the talk by saying that not everything makes sense, right? And especially with the monk's rules and the monk's form, it doesn't make very much sense. But it kind of works. 
It's a vehicle and it's a form and it's good enough as a form for the transmission of the teachings. And curiously, after the Buddha passed away, his disciples split up into groups and started arguing with each other. And there was the meditators, there was the chanters, there was the ordained, there was the non-ordained, there was the ones who followed the Sutta teachings but not the Vinaya teachings, um, there's ones who emphasize lay people and monks. Out of all of these groups, supposedly 18 schools, the one school that survived, which is the Theravada school, is the school that did the recitations. And that's how we come, we still have Buddhism. The meditation school died out, the scholarly school died out, all the other schools died out, but the recitation school survived. So I find it interesting. So this is a vehicle and the monks rules and regulations don't make much sense. But they're good enough. They're a good vehicle for the transmission of the teachings, for getting into the practice. You know, there's a few people here who have actually been monks for a little while, uh, or nuns. One or two have been considering it. It's a beautiful thing. It, talking about symbols and hazing rituals, if you become a monk and you've made even a few weeks dedication to that cause of enlightenment, this really stands out in your life as a symbol for that aspiration to carry with you. Most of the time as a monk, you're not spending in meditation, you're spending doing rituals and learning how to do the robes. So if you ordain as a monk for a month, that's how you spend your time. But as a symbol in your lifetime of commitment and dedication to that very vague and abstract quality of enlightenment, it's supremely powerful. So, some of the things, uh, should monks smoke cigarettes or not smoke cigarettes? There is no rule against smoking cigarettes in the monks' vineyard. And that's why sometimes you see monks smoking. It's not against the rules. Many temples have their own rules and say no smoking. I think certainly all sane people, even smokers, all sane people would discourage smoking cigarettes. I smoked for 20 years. As, uh, it's now uh, just over 10 years since I had a cigarette, so I did stop smoking because it's insane to keep smoking. But So you can smoke a cigarette, but you can't sit in a collapsible chair in the second story. <laughs> there is an explanation for that, by the way, but if you want to know about it. So this form that we have within the monks, it's good enough. It doesn't make much sense. It's interesting that we see the bad behavior of monks instead of rewritten stories of the good behavior. So, we've talked about Buddhism, animism, and superstition. I've tried to suggest why these stories are important and why we don't want to get overly rationalistic to try to make sense of things but to enter into the story because that's the teaching and that's the vehicle for the transmission of the teachings. And I've also mentioned a little bit about how the monks' rules and regulations, which again is another set of stories and customs and not much different to animistic customs. The rules and regulations don't make much sense, so maybe they do need some adjustment. There's certainly room for reform, but the monks are certainly not going to have soldiers doing it. So then the Bangkok Post writes that the monks are afraid of their power being taken away. They're afraid of being investigated. They want to maintain their power base and blah, blah, blah. Well, Thich Nhat Hanh, who's probably the world's second most famous monk, he rewrote the Vinaya, the monk's rules, for his monks. So they have a set of rules now that is unique to them. He has some authority to do that, but if you're not in Thich Nhat Hanh's group, you're not going to follow those rules. One of his rules was monks are not allowed to have a private email address. Right? And a lot of monks, even Thai monks, will follow this too. You would have a private email, but you would either invite other people to inspect it, or other people you give the password to so that they could inspect it, just to maintain the propriety of your behavior. So, who decides? That's, a, that's the question. Um, it's like the House of Lords in England. 
It makes no sense to have hereditary peers as lawmakers in the country of England. No sense. Why should... Jamie Lee Curtis is in the House of Lords, right? The actress. Because she married a lord and now she's a lady and she gets to go in the Houses of Lords. She's not even English. And yet the House of Lords kind of works in Britain. And there's resistance to changing it because it is kind of a good organization and they do good things. So I think the monks rules are like that. It's a weird system that's out of context. But it kind of works. It's a good enough vehicle. Right? Uh, as for superstition animism, as they say, many of the stories in Buddhism floating your bowl upstream, they would say, well, that's animistic, but that's a Buddhist story. Appeasing the devas in the trees, animism, but that's a Buddhist story and maybe it works. One woman I know, she went to release birds in front of the temple. You've seen this tradition, right? Birds, snails, eels, tortoises, and different animals. And each animal that you release has a different meaning. You can even do buffalo and cows. And each has a different meaning for, you know, if you want your business to do well, or you want to get rid of sickness, or you want to get pregnant, you, have, you release different animals, right? So she bought a bird in a cage and she's on her way to the temple to release the bird. And on the way into the temple, she stopped for some noodles. And she put the cage down next to the canal and started to eat her noodles. And the local cat comes along, goes for the bird, knocks the cage into the canal, and the poor little thing drowns. So then she's coming like, how do I cleanse my bad karma from that now? <laughs> Thais don't take these things too seriously. I think they relate to it in a very easygoing way, right? They, they just enter into the story of it. They're not really, really believing it in a hard way that Westerners would interpret. I think they're quite happy with these kind of vague things, right? Thai society is very vague. I would suggest to those people, animism is just a big part of Buddhism. It's not supposed to be separate. There was no clause of exclusivity. I am the only God, I am a jealous God, and you have no other gods but me that we have in Christianity. Before the Buddha died, he was uh, near a town of the Vajians, Vajans, Vajians, and they asked him, how do we make sure that our society is firm and long lasting? He said, you have to rewrite the constitution. No, he didn't. <laughs> Sorry, my little... <laughs> he said, make sure that you offer the due offerings to the local shrines and gods. Okay? Very interesting. If they want their society to last well, they should maintain their offerings to the local shrines and gods. Very interesting. Any other question, George?